the feast of St. Michael and all angels, the collect. Let us pray. O everlasting God, who hast ordained and constituted the services of angels and men in a wonderful order, mercifully grant that, as thy holy angels always do, thee service in heaven, so by thy appointment they may succor and defend us on earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For the epistle, the lesson from the 12th chapter of the Revelation to St. John, beginning with the 7th verse. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Here endeth the lesson. The Holy Gospel is written in the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning with the first verse. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be converted, and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life hot or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Well, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, they loved not their lives unto the death. That's what we see in today's reading from the book of Revelation. Uh, personally, I had to sort of rediscover the book of Revelation at one point in my life, because I, I tell you, it's a book that every lunatic that reads it creates an entire system of eschatology and even theology that, I mean, just appeals to the to people who, without theology, it reminds me of what 
G.K. Chesterton once said in the Middle Ages that people were so religious that without theology they would have gone mad. By theology, I simply mean the Word of God, studying what he has revealed. And the last thing in the world I would ever do as a Bible study is one of those end-time explorations of comparing Revelation with Daniel. Uh, there's been just so much of that. But I regain my appreciation for it because of the blood of the Lamb. And this has a lot to do with today's themes. I mean, this is one of our appointed readings for a reason. You know, spiritual warfare in the heavens where God's angels are in a very mysterious way at war with the powers of evil and darkness who cannot prevail since they're trying to prevail against God has an obvious effect on us on earth. And if you don't believe that, just watch the news today. But the fact of the matter is that the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony and the willingness to die for that word of our testimony is how evil is overcome in this world, even in, in within our own experience, our own finite experience in this life. And in that battle, we have God's angels with us. But the reason I, for a while, had been very soured on the book of Revelation, besides the fact that, as I say, everyone who's mentally unstable reading the book is going to, you know, really come up with weird ideas, is the fact that, uh, you know, we constantly heard justifications for violence and fighting and all of those things as something that could somehow be holy because of the warring and the battle that goes on and the fact that Christ is blood-stained garments. And then I realized, with a little help, that the blood on his garments, the blood that stains his garments in the book of Revelation, is his own blood. When the lion of the tribe of Judah is seen by John in the vision, and he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's so identified by the angel speaking to John. What does he appear as? He appears in sight as a lamb that was slain. And this is how he overcomes. This is how he this is how evil is overcome. It is, evil is, you overcome evil, says St. Paul, with good. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is the evil of this world has, in a sense, already been defeated because of the blood of Jesus, his own blood, not the blood of his enemies. His own blood, which he deliberately, willingly gave and allowed to be shed. That's the blood that overcomes the evil one, that overcomes Satan. Now, the next thing that overcomes him is the word of our testimony. And it's very common in many evangelical churches and other Protestant churches for people to be called on to give, quote, their testimony. And by that they mean an autobiographical account of how they were lost and now they're found, how they were blind and now they see. And I will not say that there's no value in that. Of course there is. I mean, the personal testimony of St. Paul is part of the book of Acts where he recites what he had gone through, which we first read about. But the testimony of the church begins on the first Easter. That's the word of our testimony. 
And this testimony was handed down to us generation by generation from the apostles who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. That's the testimony that we have that overcomes the devil. What overcomes evil is the reality that his blood was shed and that all sin has been taken away. And that we have inherited the testimony of eyewitnesses who confirmed in their own generation that they had seen Christ risen from the dead. So you see what overcomes the evil one is the gospel. Christ died for our sins as foretold in scripture and was buried and rose again the third day as was foretold in scripture and appeared to witnesses. And the third thing that overcomes evil is they loved not their lives unto death. Doesn't mean they hated their lives in the modern sense that they just were miserable people. That's not what it means. It means they didn't choose life over death at the point of decision to be a martyr because your testimony for Jesus is such that it will now cost you your life as it did many Christians in those early centuries and in other countries as it still does today. It means in other words, that because we know Christ rose from the dead, we don't fear death. We will go ahead and proclaim the truth of the gospel even if someone is sticking a gun in our face, even if someone is ordering us that we must never preach Jesus, we will still proclaim the word of our testimony. Christ is risen from the dead and he has appeared unto witnesses. Now, of course, what we're reading about today tells us we're not alone. This is our way of taking part in, in whatever the struggle really is that's beyond our understanding, one which will end, one which God is allowing. And the effect that it has on the earth, as I said, is obvious. Anyone who cannot see that there's genuine evil in the world and it's at work only needs to look at the news. There it is. There it is whether it's Russia invading the Ukraine or terrorist actions or all the things that go on. There's evil and there's darkness out there. And God's army in this world is exactly what we read about, or sorry, let me rephrase that, exactly what we prayed in the collect. God's army in this world is the services of angels and men in a wonderful order. Now, of course, remember the word men, which it comes up a lot in our liturgy and in the Bible. We have the older translation. Does not mean adult male. There's been a great big lie told even to kids in college since the 70s that Every time you see the word men in this traditional literature or man and all the use of male pronouns meant that they were excluding women and children. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It was the inclusive word. And because we're using all liturgy, we're stuck with it. And, uh, but it, it means human being when it's in that context. Remember, the word woman means female man, human. So when you come across, when I stand up here and say, if any man sin, I mean women as well. I mean children as well. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The invention of the idea that that was meant to exclude everyone but adult males is a lie. And it has no bearing in truth whatsoever. What I'm saying is you're all in God's army, everyone in this room. 
as a soldier in God's army. Uh, that's that's the truth. And you, know, you say, I didn't realize I was signing up for that. I just wanted to join a church. No, we're all in God's army. I take prayer very seriously because it's a very powerful weapon and we're supposed to yield that, wield that, no yield. We're supposed to wield that weapon. And I mean wield it every day. To pray in faith that God is hearing the prayers of his church, of his people. That he'll hear your prayers about your own needs and also your prayers about his will and his kingdom and the mission we all have as the church. We are called to overcome Satan, his work in our world, around us where we see it, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. This is the gospel. Ready, even if necessary, to let our own lives be lost for his sake. We live in a country where nobody's threatening to kill us just for being Christians, but they're we have people in our own ACC of whom that is not true. They, I remember when the Bishop of Pakistan was here in our church one Sunday. The fact of the matter though is we're all in God's army, but we're not alone. We have of course the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But what we also have uh, that we are reminded of in today's reading there's an army around us of God's angels and we don't see right now everything as it really is I think that's a mercy I believe in our state in which we're still fallen subject to sin and death if we actually saw the a company of heaven that is always surrounding us it would be too much, it would overwhelm us. When I stand at the altar and I say, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, that isn't just poetic language. We are surrounded right now by angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. We are in the presence of God. Heaven is all around us. But if our eyes were open to it right now, we could not tolerate it. We could not stand it. It would be too much for us until we undergo a transformation. And until we become raised from the dead, Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And until we have that, that nature imparted to us that is immortal, that he has been given to give to us, we really cannot bear the sight of such brilliance as what is around us. But I say that and rem to remind you of the second book of the Kings when Elisha saw the enemy armies coming to, and they were surrounding him and his servant was there. And he, his servant was afraid because this was nothing but a little company of prophets and they were the ones being attacked by the enemy army because the enemy king had been told, the reason you keep losing the wars against Israel is there's a prophet there, Elisha. And he knows whatever you say in secret in your own bedroom. So he thought, okay, I'm going to go capture this prophet and then I'll take on the king of Israel. And this time I'll win. So he shows up and there's no army just a company of prophets and the servants afraid. And Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And suddenly he sees them. He sees that they're surrounded by the angels of God, a greater number than the enemy army that's advancing on them. And then, of course, the enemy army is struck with blindness. The prophet's prayer and led to Samaria where the king takes them all prisoner. <laughs> well, then they're given a meal and told to go home and they didn't bother Israel again in that period of time. 
we're not in this by ourselves. There's that the, the, the company of angels that are around us is real. And we can, with some confidence, go about God's work. We go about it together. Again, these are the things that defeat Satan. The blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony. <clears throat> loving not our lives unto death. After all, we don't fear death. Christ is risen from the dead. Death is overcome. Now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, be ascribed as is most justly due. Almighty majesty, dominion, power, and glory, henceforth world without end. Amen. 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 Amen.